Good evening, everyone. I believe that we are live on Facebook. I, there's always a minute between when we think we're live and when we are live. So you might just have missed the beginning of my introduction. My name's Becky. I am the Communications and Marketing Officer for Western Super Mayor Town Council. And I am delighted that we're talking to Chris Baring. I feel like um, this it was a conversation that we had with our climate change uh, group uh, within the town council that we, you were on the top of our wish list when we decided that we wanted to interview uh, people so thank you very much for joining us and, and absolutely welcome and, and I feel like we've got I mean we we're just chatting before uh, we went live and I feel that we've got so much to say so for people who don't know who you are talk a little bit about your passions your background and um, yeah great over to you yeah thank you and um Good evening, everybody in Western Super Mare. I'm waving to you from all the way up at, up the estuary in Portishead. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I've I've been a full time conservationist for this is my thirtieth year. Can you believe it? I can't believe it myself. It's just flown by. Um, and I work for an organisation called the Hawk and Owl Trust. Um, but obviously. Uh, prior to that, and I would say that my real passion for wildlife probably started when I was about three years old. And according to my, my late mother, it was um, collecting insects from the garden and uh, bringing them into the house and frightening her to death because she didn't know anything about them and I didn't know anything about them and I was asking questions. And, and from then on, I would say it, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful voyage of discovery because a lot of those early days were very very interesting because even before um, I could learn to read uh, and write properly um, I was I was discovering things and come and if people couldn't answer me I was coming up with the answer so it, there was a lot of observational research if you like and then of course when I was able to learn to read and write the whole thing just explodes and it's it's just and it's been a passion uh, all of my life it's not my only interest um i have lots and lots of other interests um i'm very interested in, for instance again when i was very young i started um an interest and a passion for astronomy as well um and um then as i moved through i began to get very interested in music but again there's a pattern here there's a very very interesting pattern and that is with astronomy, with music, and with uh, with with the wildlife interest. There were, at the time, there was nobody around to show me what to do. And so, um, for instance, uh, my mother got me a guitar when I was probably about um, ten. I was probably ten or eleven years old. I, I didn't even know how to tune it. And so, I would listen to records and work it out, start working things out, and um, and then. I would happen to meet somebody who would say, oh, you want to learn to play chords? What's a chord? Oh, you put a load of notes together and come up with... <laughs> and, and that's, you know, that's me. That's a sum up of me. And that's how I've done things. So that voyage of discovery, the ability to uh, learn and learn new things all the time. And so bringing things up to date at the age that I am now, which is not very old, really, um, is would be the... the my passion and enthusiasm is still the same as it was when I was a little boy. It's still there. And still, uh, I use a barn owl here as an example. So because barn owls were already on decline when I was, when I was growing up, I never had the opportunity to see them. And then, uh, again, I think I was probably about 10 or 11, I saw my first barn owl floating across the Gordano Valley. And the excitement and the... the the, the my whole body froze completely froze and and I realized what I was looking at was was divine you know it's just wonderful and it's a really weird thing to say but every time I see a barn owl now I get transported back and I see a lot of barn owls <laughs> so that sums sums me up um there's been some fantastic amazing things which have happened along the way when I started with the Hawk and Owl Trust, um, one of the things that was driving me prior to that was community engagement. So uh, one of the things that I really loved to do was to go and observe something or, or experience something in nature and not keep it to myself. I wanted to share it. 
So obviously doing lectures was, was a great way to, to share it, to share it to a wider audience. Um, and I think I did, I think I'm right in um, thinking that I did my first ever lecture to the public when I was 12 years old on the local badgers. So, um, and, and again, it, it's, that, it's that thirst to share the knowledge that you have. Um, and when I started with the Hawk and Owl Trust, I, we had lots and lots of different projects all throughout the 30 years. And the majority of them include the public, they include the community. And, and even, um, I think it was probably 10 years ago, we started something called the Community Owls Project. And that still rolls on today. It has longevity, basically, because it involves the public. It works. This was something that we were talking about when we when we kind of like started. And I always think, oh, you don't talk about what you were talking about before, but it's a really good segue into, into that conversation. Um, and, you know, obviously, as a, as a town council, we're trying to do our absolutely best towards climate change in every way that we have the power to be able to do so. So we've taken on board some very new assets recently. Um, we've taken on board Ellenborough Park West, which we're turning into um, a well-being park. We've got a badger set there. We've got some very old trees there. We've got some very rare plants that are there as well with some really interesting uh, history of the fact that we think that seeds were dropped by some of the military that were camping there going mm -hmm. back in into the times of the war. Um, it's very um, mossy. So when you walk on it, you feel like you're walking on, on fluffy clouds. We also have just um, got a 35 year lease uh, to take care of um, the uh, Old Town Quarry. So, and of course we've got um, the, uh, the cemetery. How as a council looking at it from it's really got to be the thoughts and views of our community. Yeah, definitely. It's got to be community led. What, what would you say? How can we engage? What can we do in order to get? I mean, obviously, this is a QA, and a So anyone want to ask any questions? of really? Chris, But anyone want to make any comments to the council as well? Please do. We will read all of those. We always do. But yeah, what would be your thoughts on our best moves to be able to do that? Um, I would say straight away, gift the whole thing to the public. In other words, make it a ground up approach. Don't make it a top down approach. Mm. Um, those, those type of projects work extremely well. Um, I'm fascinated with the fact that you've, you've taken over, you did say a cemetery, didn't you? You've taken over. So we haven't taken over the cemetery. The cemetery has been with us for an awfully long time. So that's Milton Road Cemetery. And Milton Road Cemetery has got some real ancient trees within it. We've yeah. also started rewilding, but, but the idea of rewilding in most people's minds is kind of getting seed bombs and chucking them into, into dirt areas um, or just letting everything completely overgrow. But what we're doing with the cemetery is we're making sure that there's still important pathways that have got, have got to lead to important places. But we've actually discovered a whole set of species of plants that we didn't know were there, um, that were just a lot that have, has sprung up in this year that we haven't been cutting everything back. I think we haven't been cutting back for the last two years now, um, since we have a new grounds manager. And what's been happening is we've discovered really, um, again, rare species of plants, but also a huge uh, amount of moths and butterflies that we've never seen there before. We're trying to document and keep a record, but we are also looking for volunteers to help us with that as well, with our um, Love the Outdoors uh, programme. I, I think that what you're saying there is, is, is absolutely marvellous. It's, it's wonderful. And, and that's the type of thing I would like to see happening right throughout the district. That's, there is, rewilding shouldn't be, um, it can be anything to anybody at the end of the day, uh, but um, the real basis of rewilding should be that you let nature dictate a little bit of, of what you do. Now you still have to employ management or else places like cemeteries are gonna end up as, uh, a, a scrub area which is going to turn into a major woodland and people aren't going to be able to get access to it now you want people to be enthused about nature and if you if you want to make people enthused you have to give them access that is incredibly important so the fact that you're maintaining the pass through there is incredibly important but some of the descriptions you had in there for instance i think you mentioned something about that people might want you to see bomb um, what I would say is that if you've catalogued 
your, the trees that you've got there, the mature trees, yeah? Well, if it came to a point whereby you turn around and say, right, well, we need more trees, if that was a possibility, what I would say to you is don't go running off to the typical tree scheme. Look at what you've got there already that's native, native trees, and don't manage underneath them so that basically what, what will happen then is that young trees will start growing from seeds that have basically fallen down. And what the trees rely on there is, for example, things like squirrels, which I'm sure you've got, um, and jays uh, and rooks to come along. I mean, that, that's, that's just a, a, a small example. Uh, obviously, you can have wood mice as well, bank poles, but they'll be reliant on those animals to come along and, and grab those uh, seeds, nuts, whatever it is, and take them away to somewhere where it's light so that the tree can actually, the new baby tree can actually grow. But a massive proportion of them get left behind. So those trees that are left behind at this time of the year, those will start coming up. But as soon as the tree canopy comes over, there's no more light. So that's the relationship between, uh, between the wild animals, so to speak, and the actual tree itself. And on what I would say is that you can replicate that. So in other words, it's local trees for local areas. So you actually either prick out a sapling that's coming up and you literally move it, or you collect seeds from those trees, not all of them, because you want wildlife to do its bit as well, and obviously to consume, but you, you, and then you bring them on and this is one of the things that we were we were going to do here at Wild Portishead. Um, uh, what we were actually going to do was uh, involve the public all the way through the process. So we would actually go out collecting the seeds for the new trees for Portishead. The public would bring them on in their gardens. So the public are involved in that. They literally adopt this thing as it as it grows. And then when it reaches a sufficient height, uh, they get to take it out and plant it where there's a designated place to plant it, but it involves the public all the way through. So the public actually get to choose where the tree actually goes, where the best place for the tree is. And, and that to me is a, is, is a win-win situation for nature and for people, basically because the, the people on the ground have had the say all the way through. And now you've got, you've got a great project because it's not just the classic three-year project or five-year project. This is a project which becomes intergenerational. In other words, all of that is written down somewhere. And so the people in 20 years time can exactly see who adopted that tree, who brought it on and who planted it. You've got it. That's a public project. That's a really exciting thing to do. I am just going to post onto Facebook um, a link to our uh, Love the Outdoors page, which explains to people how they can um, become part of that by joining the uh, volunteer programme Love the Outdoors. So I've just posted that there. We've got some, got some comments coming through, but no questions yet. Do post any questions. If you've got any questions, um, then feel free to do that. I will try and keep up with them as much as I can. Um, Good, Becky. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> kind of are like the comments all, are the comments all good oh the comments are all great absolutely and and they wouldn't be bad about you that's that's a thing it would be more kind of like i'm worried the council are going to upset the birds in the summer uh, in in the quarry and um, and we and we did talk a little bit about that beforehand as well about how best to look after what's going on in the quarry as well so that's all good stuff tell us a bit about big world because that was uh, there's some work that you're yeah. doing there as well that i was yeah tell us about that yeah yeah um well, I got invited to get involved with Big World quite a few years ago now. And um, basically my job there was to uh, go down and enthuse the community about the environment, the natural environment that they had. And uh, I've got to be completely honest, I didn't know what to expect when I, when I went in. And um, lovely bunch of people there, They're absolutely lovely. But the thing that got me, Becky, was that we were we, we we did our very first walk um and so that that's how we did it basically we we did monthly walks and we took the community out and we started pointing out various things but the thing that really got me was there's a gold mine there it's absolutely gorgeous you have all these little lanes which interconnect um different roads different parts of the estate so to speak and then you have the parks as well 
Castle Birch uh, being one, which uh, I, I have fond memories of. <clears throat> And they're gold mines, they're absolute gold mines. And I give you an example here in Portishead, you know, we, we are, are two species which I grew up with, which were incredibly common. I've seen uh, massive national declines. It's going to shock a few people, but those two species are the house sparrow and the starling. Now, here in Portishead was very much a part of that national decline taking place. And uh, when I got to go down to Big Whirl, I was gobsmacked because uh, there were still big populations of house sparrows, big populations of starlings. And that says something very important to me. That says, uh, for example, there is still a, a high complement of insects for them to actually feed on. And the, although these are two species of bird which will come to your garden and they'll feed on whatever you, you give them, on the bird table or on the lawn or whatever they'll, they'll take anything uh, but they need to rear their babies on insects pure protein if they haven't got that they're not producing enough babies and that's what was happening here at, for example Portishead, said and that's what's been happening right around the country so there's been not enough young produced to replace the adult mortality so down the population goes and that's what we've been seeing um, and then in Whirl, of course, I get there and I go, wow, what's happened? Starlings and sparrows, this is like going back to my youth. This is amazing numbers here. And not just them, things like greenfinches as well, linnets down the lane. Um, and those type of species may not mean anything to people, but to me, they mean, they mean that, that uh, there's a little bit of countryside uh, or what we imagine is countryside within that particular area. So my job there was then to explain to them what they've got, uh, teach them identification skills. So I do things like, for instance, we did a four week course on birdsong. Uh, and then we actually went out um, uh, across places like Castle Batch at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I got them all up at four o'clock in the morning. It was amazing. <laughs> and, and, um, and we found, for example, by doing that, another red listed species, the song thrush they had in Castle Birch. In incredible, you know, and uh, there's a lovely lady there uh, called, um, I'm gonna mention her, cause I know she's probably watching, Julie, Julie Hitchens, who, who uh, I met for the first time by doing Big World. And she has a particular skill of cataloging things. So she will write down everything that we saw, everything that we heard. And so there's a there's the beginning of some real solid data coming out from from Big Whirl. Unfortunately, all that's been put on ice for the moment um, because obviously because of the pandemic. Uh, but I honestly I can't wait to get back with those people because um, you know we were we we'd got to a point whereby quite deliberately on my part we'd got to a point whereby um, I'd given them enough information they were coming up with 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 their own observations and their own data. Uh, and, and then what I was going to try to get them to do was then start talking to the, the power people, start talking to the councillors, start talking to the council about what they wanted to see within their own big rural area uh, that would actually benefit the wildlife and the people. Very, very important. So what is Big World doing right then that isn't happening in Porter's Head in regards to looking after the, the ins insect life and taking it that way around? There's oh, a lot by the way, hi to Julie, she is here. I, she's got left a message. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Julie. Oh, you're not supposed to do waving on Zoom, are you? I, nah. I, 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 yeah, it's, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, so the big difference will be again it'll be it'll be management it'll be it'll be things like how much foliage have you got how much maintenance have you got you know insects rely on uh, a lot of foliage uh, and and simple things like when you're walking down some of those pathways you find outcrops of bramble now bramble is incredibly important it, it, it's I, I do i do a gardening talk uh, gardening for wildlife talk which i do right around the country and um you know one of the things becky i have to admit here for the first time i'm not a gardener 
and there I am stood up in front of all these people telling them how to garden. It's quite amazing. sure you look great with a shovel though. You could just stand there with the shovel with your hand on your hip, just looking like you know what you're doing. You know, well, that's, that's what I do. that's what I do in my own garden. But don't tell my partner that for goodness sake. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> um, so yeah. What, what I say to to them is is uh, when I'm doing these gardening talks is is here's a bramble bush. What does bramble produce? Well. In the, spring, in the late spring and summer, they produce these beautiful rose-like flowers which cover the entire bush, which is incredibly important for butterflies, bees, other pollinators, blah, blah, blah. But there's just so many of them in one bramble bush. It's just terrific. So earlier on, before the flowers come out, obviously, what, what, do, what, do, what do brambles do for birds? Well, um, here's a task for you. Use your bare hand. Put your hand in a bramble bush and see what it comes out like. So why do birds nest in bushes? Well, it's pretty obvious why, because they're going for protection. So the more of that you have, the more uh, protected nesting sites you have for a whole, whole list of different uh, bird species that can nest in those. So after the flowers come, of course, the green berries, then of course you've got the red berries, and then you've got the blackberries. Very good for people, because we, uh, when we were doing our autumn ones, we would find the public actually out picking the blackberries along with blackbirds, song thrushes, and everything else that was, was eating them. So, uh, and then uh, an animal which in, in Portishead we've seen decline uh, quite a lot, gets great benefit out of uh, thorny bushes. And we've just had a big hit here in, in, in Portishead with a uh, wild Portishead. We've just managed to secure our first hedgehog warning signs. So we're really pleased here. But, Bramble is extremely important for things like hedgehogs to hide underneath. It gives them protection away from any potential predator that might be around. So I think it's things like that which which really do make the the, the difference. But or, or, or you know before again before the pandemic, uh, we'd already started to look at somewhere like um, Castle Batch uh, Park, and um, there's a lovely line of trees which goes along. Um, uh, alongside of a hedge and what we did was with Big Roll is we put up um, the Big Roll people they made their own nesting boxes and we put them up in the parks and we really used them as a test for what the insect complement was like because judging by the amount of young birds that were produced from those boxes we could gauge how good or how not so good it was and then came up with this wonderful idea of of there was probably about a five meter gap between the, uh, a line of trees, so I'm doing that, to the, <laughs> to, the, to the hedge in the road. So again, as a first experiment for the, for the uh, big world community to actually engage council, uh, we got two council officers to come out and we got them to come up with their own plan of not managing this, this piece of land and it was incredible. Um, I mean, when we left it, I'm sure Julie will say as well, it was for, for, for wildlife, it was like lighting the blue touch paper. Boom, off it went. And we, uh, at the same time, that wasn't excluding people because people had the paths, etc. much like you're saying with what you're doing. So, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the big difference. And talking about exploded, I'm just looking at the comments coming in, which I can hardly keep track of. Um, Debbie Apted has said uh, that the plastic free team uh, are making 500 bird boxes to put in the area. We've had a comment about what happened to all the ladybirds. I used to see so many of them as, as a kid. And at the moment, Wild Porter's Head is, um, is chatting with Julie and um, there's a whole thing kind of like coming up about creating um, a wildlife gardening kind of courses and workshops. Um, also on our page, um, which is the uh, Western in Bloom Facebook page that the Town Council run, uh, for the whole of last summer, we interviewed uh, a gardening expert from the BBC, um, Mary Payne. So there's some pre-recorded... Yep. Yeah, you know, Mary, uh, Mary's just great. Um, so there's some pre-recorded information as well that's on that Facebook page, if any of you are interested in that, because there were some of the questions that I was also asking Mary at the time as well. Um, Mary and I have something in common. Uh, what, she can garden, you can't? I mean, what's the... <laughs> that's not in common. <laughs> that's not in common. We're both MBEs. Yes, you are. That is true. That is true. For similar reasons? No, totally different. No. No, no. Do you want to, do you want to I, talk about how you got yours and why? Uh, well, I I don't know I don't know I don't know who did it, 
apparently you never know who did it, who sent it in. But um, yeah, it was 2001. Um, and uh, it was for services to conservation. It's a long time ago now. I, I haven't been promoted since. I thought by now it'd be a night. I mean, come on. It's all too slow. Um, so yeah, and what I actually did was I, I I I received a letter from. Do you remember Tony Blair? I re I received a letter from Tony Blair, and uh, when I, <laughs> I just, when I actually opened it up, I read it, and I said to I said to Emma, I said, uh, God, somebody's mucking about, and I actually ripped it up. <laughs> somebody, I thought somebody was being a wally and sending me false letters so i ripped it up and put it in the bin no <laughs> i did and so anyway i went for a walk a quite a long walk and uh, when i came back i thought well there is a way to prove whether it's authentic so i stuck it back together and held it up to the light and it had the darn seal didn't it <laughs> it was real <laughs> so um yeah and so i felt really guilty about it i felt really I, I I thought uh, I had real I had real problems with it at first. I thought, why me? Why have I got this? You know, I haven't done anything special for goodness' sake. Um, there's loads of people out there that should have got this. Why me? Why me? And it was it was a little bit like that. And um, so then I decided I had to do something. Um, and when it came to actually collecting the medal, which was from Her Majesty the Queen, and um, I decided to do a walk from Portishead to Buckingham Palace, all up the A4. It was, it was great, it was brilliant. Um, and the reason why I did it was that at the time, in 2001, it was foot and mouth. And of course, a lot of my work has been with the farming community. Um, and the farming community have been absolutely amazing uh, towards, towards my ideas, towards me as an individual and they've been so supportive I wanted to give them something back so I did, I did the walk um, raising money for the Royal Agricultural Benevolent Institution and um, that was that was it was it was great it was a wonderful time um, but I still don't know why anything I do is special nothing it's not special I think when you have a passion for something and you live and breathe it like you said about the when you see an owl and it just takes you back to that moment I think when we, I would call that being in a genius state. There's something about your genius that feels so natural to you. Everyone else can see it as genius, but you can't. And, and I think that that's true of anyone who's a genius, whether or not your genius is playing a piano or being a whirling dervish or a flamenco dancer or whatever you are. When you're in that zone where you find something that you could talk endlessly about, um, you know, that, that that is your thing. Of course you don't see it because it's so much a part of you. It's almost like the blood in your veins. Mm. So uh, your job's just to say thank you and show up and, and, take it and walk there and go, <laughs> that's it. That's all you're supposed to do. That, that, that's all right. It was, it was a lovely walk. It was a lovely walk. I did enjoy it very much. And it actually, actually, it was, it was inspirational because when I got to London on the A4, and, and I started to go into London. This is this is going to be. Uh, if anybody's having their tea at the moment, they might like to just put it down. This is a warning, warning. This is not a good bit. So when I got to London, I had a funny taste in my mouth, and um, the taste got really bad, and my throat started to get a sore throat, and I actually spat on my hand, and I couldn't believe. My saliva was full of little black bits. Yeah. And it was car pollution. Yeah. And I recently read, um, there's been a, a lovely paper which has come out, which I recommend people try and track down. I can't remember exactly what it's called now, but um, it, it's basically about using vegetation to offset car pollution. And it is extremely good. Uh, so, it, I mean, trees, we know what they do. They, they, they'll absorb them up, we throw at them, and they'll turn that back into oxygen. But we also shouldn't rule out uh, native hedges. Ha native hedges can be incredibly important. They're doing the same thing. They're absorbing as well. And, and, a, and a critical thing here as part of the paper was the, the, the amount of trees 
that you you put along so it wasn't necessarily a great it wasn't necessarily a forest along a road it was the the trees uh spaced in a certain way uh did the best job at, at absorbing the pollution um and and it's funny how things really go full circle from that walk to reading that paper to then standing up for instance in the folk hall in portishead in front of all the councillors and a room full of people and delivering um, basically what was the beginnings of Wild Porter's Head with Jonathan Mock and myself um, and, uh, and actually stating a lot of these facts and, and calling for a 30% increase in the tree coverage um, uh, in Porter's Head and the chairman of the council basically doing this to me who was sat next to me uh, saying you might like to increase that to 50%, Chris. <laughs> Love it! Yeah. Uh, I, I used to live in London. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I think I was hardly... I lived opposite a train station, I think, protected by a wisteria tree that we that was grown as a bush yeah. on the side of the house and the front of the house, uh, which, which was a great thing. We've had a couple of questions come in, so just want to run those by you. Um, so... Um, fastening bird boxes to trees because sticking nails in the tree itself is quite a bad idea. So uh, Marianne has got that question. What's the best way to fix a bird box to a tree? Cable ties, um, but you must be monitoring your boxes on a regular basis. So basically you can cable tie them to or band them. Uh, uh, you can do that, get a nice thick if you're using for um, tip boxes and robin boxes, so those are the small bird boxes. Um, for instance, when we're putting up owl boxes, uh, we've recently got two owl boxes put up in um, one of Portishead cemeteries. Those have been banded with um, bands, uh, proper webbing. Um, but again, you need to check them uh, to make sure that the tree is is not suffering because of the banding. So. If you're doing a proper box project, then basically once a year you're checking your boxes and uh, another time in the within the year you're cleaning your boxes out. So you're monitoring on a regular basis. And obviously if you're doing that in Western and the rural area, hopefully you're feeding that back into the local community, back to yourselves at the town council. That would be a wonderful thing. Set up your own nature database. Yeah. I'm not telling you what to do, by the way. <laughs> it's just... Don't worry, don't worry. I, I, I tell you, we we're not short of ideas, that's for sure. Um, uh, Denise has just asked, um, when we come out of lockdown, will you be doing more walks in Whirl and Western? Yes, yes. I'm dying to get back to doing that again. That was just marvellous, wonderful group of people. And, um, yeah, desperate to get back um, as, as, as soon as lockdowns finished and if anybody knows when anybody's got any ideas when that might be mm, uh, yeah that would uh, that would be the question i'd probably be laying bets on it down at the bookies if i knew um uh, and also another question on um what's the best plants to plant in our gardens uh, to be bee friendly and insect friendly oh what a goody goody i love it well um a lot of people will frown on what I'm going to say, but you can't beat a bit of Budlier, you know. You can't beat a bit of Budlier. Um, and the thing with, with Budlier, there's lots of plants, but I'm going to pick on Budlier. Um, we grew, um, we, we've got a, a, an old quarry quite close to us where uh, the, the Budlier just gets hacked every year, it just gets attacked by, by people. And um, what, we done, what we did is we found some young budlia growing we knew what was going to happen to it so we got it out and we brought it down to the garden and what we do in order to attract the maximum amount of insects uh diurnally and nocturnally because the moths absolutely love it as well um is that we prune it back uh once the last flowers are finished we prune it right back to its base and then it'll come back again next year wonderful um you can't beat it that's brilliant. I've got two uh, buddies as well. One I keep as a bush and the other one I let go as a tree. So yeah, that's that's great. Um, a question that's coming is, what are the best plants to grow for moths? Budly are obviously being one of your answers. Do you have any other answers for moths? For moths? Yes. Um, again, um, crikey, I'm trying to think there is. Definitely, um, 
I think it's the Mysteria out in the front garden where they they really go berserk on. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it it'll be it'll be anything really that you you can think of growing. Um, again, much like the butterflies, they'll they'll go to most things. Oh, um, there's a particular migratory butterfly which comes up um, from uh, I think it's Central Europe to us, mm-hmm. and um, trying to think of the name of the plant and I've lost it. It will come back when you don't think about it. It's always the way. In fact, we'll change tack and then you can... It's the one the councils normally try to get rid of. Come on, it's purple. Come on, let's put it out to the audience. Yes, somebody will know what this is. The one the councils are always getting rid of out of the pavements and I keep saying to them, look, just (laughs) let it it go because it's doing so much good. Okay, let's see what people come back with. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, are Budlias native? Do you know? Marianne's asked that. Uh, wow, well, they must be by now. Um, I'm not sure that they are actually. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that that might I think be. Need to do for... some research, and that's always good fun. Yeah, that might be one for when I get Mary Payne back. So, yep. uh, so that might be one for her. Good. I'm just going to check my notes to make sure that we've been covering everything that we that we promised that we were uh, talking about. Um, da, 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 da. Yes, I think that we have. So, so that's good. So, uh, willow herb, is that it? Rosebay willow herb. No, 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 no. I, I've totally lost it. <laughs> Don't worry. It will come back if it's meant to come back, and we can also we can always like. Valerian. There you go. <laughs> I just didn't. I have that problem with nouns all the time. I think very creative people have problems with le- left hemisphere nouns, which makes complete sense to me. Um, so, with look, we've been talking about creating um, some kind of tree forum in Western Supermare. So, we we want to become part of what's known as the National Tree Charter, and then become part of a, a tree forum. Um, you know, with, with your community engagement star hat on, what do you feel is the best way to kind of go about that? And what would be the work of a tree forum if we were to create one? What would you, can I put it back to you, Becky? What would you see as as the, the tree forum achieving? I think it's really about um, getting the community to tell us where they want, um, not us as a council, but, um, but to form a community where we can actually make decisions about where the best places for for putting in more trees are going to be because you know we're, we're well aware that the most important thing is to really take care of our of the tree stock we already have because the older trees are going to be so much more carbon neutral than the trees in which we're we're, we're planting and, and as you say the best way to do it and it's interesting what you say about that my mother does this which is she'll create um she'll get seedlings put them in a pot they start to grow they get to a certain size she takes them into the local woods digs a hole and just plants them um she's not part of any forum she's just doing Uh, it herself and just kind of with really very little expertise apart from if it grows in the pot it'll grow in the ground picks it up and goes and plants it um but maybe with a little bit more I don't know, looking at our local area, looking at our roads, looking at um, where we need to um, absorb um, carbon from from streets, right. things like that. So this, all this, of that. A lot of, a lot of what you've just said, Becky, there, that last bit especially, can be done as a desktop op- operation. So you can basically look uh, at Google Earth and look where the gaps are that you could fill in. What I would suggest uh, and again, you take a leaf out of what we proposed to do with Wild Porter's Head. Uh, and that is, uh, as soon as you've got an idea, rather than what we came up with was basically a map of what, what we would like to see, but then passed it over to the public and said, where do you want stuff? Yeah. Um, and, and that was on the basis of, the, of agreement that it was going to be local trees for local areas. So we weren't looking at that time to bring trees in from uh, bring trees in from the outside, so to speak, just using local trees, um, and I think that gets that gets you around lots of 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 different problems like disease issues and blah blah blah. Um, the other thing is is also that if if you've got places where you've got clumps of trees, 
uh, let's say small copses for argument's sake, don't think about, uh, for instance, if there's a copse there, don't think then about having a tree planting scheme on an open area there. Look back at the copse and look at, see if you can actually make that copse expand and become more sustainable. Um, there's a lovely paper which I'm, I'm, I'm only halfway through at the moment, but it talks about uh, trees basically um, as part of tree planting schemes, which are suddenly turning up in the middle of fields way or well away from existing woodlands, not doing particularly well, simply because they're not part of a community. They're not part of the tree community. So that's, that's if you like, it's the, it, what goes, is what's going on underneath the ground. So trees uh, talk to each other and exchange information and nutrient and fluid through the mycelia strands. So, um, and, and that's what I'd like to have seen a lot more of across the whole district, uh, where we actually identify where, for instance, woodlands at the moment during the pandemic, and I'm sure people in Western have seen this, uh, and certainly this is what's happening locally here in Portishead, is that our woodlands are basically being trampled because there's a lot of people going for a lot of recreation. And so one of the things that I've said locally is that one of our big woodlands here, it's just not sustainable to carry on that way. It, and, and the thing to do is to, instead of planting trees in all these different places, actually go back, look at the big wood. How can we make that more sustainable for a population of is it 23,000 we've got, or is it more than that now in Portishead? Anyway, how can we make that more sustainable for the people, let alone the wildlife that lives there? And so there must be ways of tapping into, for instance, DEFRA, and I'm talking about here on, on, the, on, the, on the wider countryside issue, whereby we actually secure some of the small copses and larger woodlands that we've had, help them to expand, maybe join up in different places. Uh, and those I see as, as amazing ways forward. And those, those things can happen really quickly. And there's another, there's a byproduct of this as well, which is educational. That very few children today have the ability to go out and watch natural succession taking place. What the heck's he talking about? Well, what he's talking about there is where you see a woodland suddenly begin to expand out, turn into scrub. Scrub is the natural tree guard that the tree has. So um, if you go back a few uh, thousand years, there's no such thing, or a few hundred years actually, or a few tens of decades of years, there's no such thing as the plastic tree guard. No, this. I don't remember that as a kid, absolutely not. How the heck do we end up with all these trees without tree guards and, and things like um, Roundup to, to, to help them grow? Um, well, actually, nature did it for it. And, and the way in which nature does it is if you take a piece of grassland next to a woodland, if you were to fence that grassland off, the grass would grow. And after about three or four years, the scrub would start to come up through. So you'd have your hawthorn, your blackthorn, your bramble coming through. Once that's established at a certain height, then the young woodland starts growing up through it. And that scrubland protects that bit of the woodland coming through. To me, that is one of the most exciting things to be able to witness. And it's just such a shame these days that, that, that our children don't get the opportunity to do that. I did when I was younger. There is one place close to me in Portishead where I can go and witness that now. But I can't think of any other area where I can go and witness that taking place. And I think, you know, if you can take some of that on board, and, and I know in, in terms of Portishead and in terms of Western, we're talking about two urban areas, but if there's anywhere where things can be expanded, tree belts can be expanded, tree lines can be expanded, the trees are talking to each other. They'll help. Absolutely. There's been a lot of good um, television documentaries about that coming out recently. Um, I, I actually recorded a, a short film uh, with a friend um, called The Secret Life of Trees, actually explaining about how, you know, those root systems work. Also, they, they, they work with um, fungi as well. So um, mushrooms yeah. and da 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 and all, all oh, it's just so absolutely, absolutely um, fascinating. So what have we missed? Any final thoughts? What are you going to kick yourself that you wish you'd said that I should have asked you that I didn't? 
<laughs> I've tried to keep up with all of the questions, but they've been coming in quite quickly. So I will send you a link to our Facebook page and see if there's any that you might need to answer afterwards. We didn't go on to music. We didn't go on to music and how your guitar playing went. I was going to give you a live... No, it's too late now, mate. Too Sorry. late. <laughs> I'll have to get you back just for that because we could we could all do with that. I think that would be that would be. I, I think the other thing that um, a straight message to Western Town Council as well, and, and that is that whilst you're doing all this marvelous work down there, and it does sound really really good, um, so when I go back to doing Big World again, I'm gonna I'm gonna deliberately go down a bit further and have a look at what you're doing. Uh, think about light pollution as well. Um, and I've been doing quite a lot of stuff on light pollution. Um, and I know there's some government directives out on it at the moment, uh, but light pollution is something, again, which cuts across, like the natural environment issues, it cuts across uh, health and well-being. Um, very important thing, but just, I'm, I'm obviously not gonna go into any more detail on that now, but if you can put that on your, to talk about light pollution, mm. uh, We've been thinking, um, because we closed the cemetery doors, I mean the, the cemetery, because it's up on a hill, has, a, has an amazing view and of course on an evening because you don't want, you know, scallywags and vandalism and all of those kinds of things, but obviously we have trees, um, out yeah. there, we have all sorts of that. And <laughs> so we're quite excited about the, the potential of maybe you know the the uh, doing perhaps tours maybe with yourself of the cemetery after dark um and no one near halloween but just to go and really get in touch very early morning or at dusk uh doing things like that um ellenborough park there's probably a fair amount of of light pollution but i would imagine being up on the hill with the cemetery even though there's street lighting all around that it's a huge um uh, amount of area there um Ellenborough mm. Park's fantastic and then of course there's the quarry which which hasn't really got an awful lot of light pollution around so I imagine that that would be an incredible place to go stargazing uh, too mm. so you know without just dis disturbing any of the wildlife because we need to be very very sensitive to that so yeah as a town council we're certainly we're looking for volunteers we're looking for um pulling together a a, a tree forum so you know, there's been loads of comments coming through. So anyone who wants to actually participate in helping us get all of this stuff right, we'd be really, really happy to talk to you. Um, yeah, there's somebody else just added, um, light pollution is a really big one. Um, question from Marianne, she said, um, is anyone going to, to mention the proposed clearance of the 20 acres of trees in Walbury Woods? Um, this is the, um, she said, uh, together, um, da, 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 the undergrowth, the bushes, the brambles, and it keeps disappearing down. Um, has been continuing through lockdown. Now, I know a little bit about this, but this is more uh, what's been going on with North Somerset Council. This is clearing, I don't know if you're actually aware of this, Chris, but this has been clearing in, in order to expose um, the hill thought that's up there. The idea was um, that that it's a small amount of area that's being cleared in order to expose the, the hill thought. I'm sure Marianne probably would argue with the small amount of area. I'm not 100% sure personally um and that there are but there is the idea that there's more going to be planted in order to make up for what's being cleared for this historical <laughs> kind of area i stop you there becky yeah <laughs> because that that is isn't that a classic of um i looked at a tree planting scheme in devon two years ago and the tree planting scheme uh i forget how much it was but it was quite expensive um, and we're talking about this tree planting scheme was right up against the woodland mm -hmm. need to do it. So if you're, if you're thinking about planting trees and you've got a woodland nearby, <coughs> utilize what you've got rather yeah. than, yeah, let, let it come back naturally. And, yeah. and again, the, the, the children that live in that area, I don't know if there's any schools in that area, I don't know much about this actually. No, 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 that's okay, don't worry, I'm throwing things at you as they're coming in, yeah, and well, I haven't even got time to process them before I'm throwing them at you, so I do. They, they will have the opportunity that I've been talking about, mm -hmm. so instead of, it, it, it always seems that, that the tree planting, and again going for um, trees from the outside, it's a quick fix, well, actually, if we just take some time and we, I don't know this area, but if, the, if it's woodland being cleared within a, a woodland area, because you mentioned Walbury Woods, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and, and that's okay. Let Warbury Woods then come back and repair it, whatever it is. Don't bring trees in. Let the natural succession take place. And what we'll get is, is a massive increase in biodiversity because of that process. Yeah. Um, and that, again, if you've got, uh, it sounds like you're going to really expand your voluntary force after tonight. If you've got those volunteers in place, they will help catalogue what comes in and what benefits because of that ideal, as opposed to suddenly just bringing trees in. Jody has asked a question exactly on that. She said, uh, is it important for everyone to record species of plants and animals found locally in environmental records office online? Y yes, um, there is a wonderful app you can get called iNaturalist. Uh, it's available for both um, Apple and the, the other ones. I don't use the other ones, the Android. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, uh, it, it's available for both. iNaturalist, uh, I, I, I highly recommend people download that because if you're uncertain, <coughs> there's a very big iNaturalist community. Your camera will basically look down at a primrose, you take a picture, and then what happens is that the algorithms will basically work out whether it's what, whatever it is. is if you don't know what it is, it'll work out what it is. But if it doesn't know, it'll send information out to the wider community and somebody will come back and say, yeah, it's a primrose. Oh, that's really useful because that's happened to us in the cemetery where we've looked at things and I've been like, I have never seen a flower like that before as well, part of our rewilding. Um, so that's a very useful app. Debbie's also, also asked- Wherever you take the picture, yeah. GPS marked. Perfect. Time and date. So yeah. it's not, it can't, it can't be faked. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And we, we definitely need that for Ellenborough Park with all of our rare plants that are there in Ellenborough Park. So that's exciting. Um, Debbie has asked, uh, and, and this is a good question. How do councils uh, and us as residents win over those who think that rewilding is just an excuse for councils not to bother looking after the area? <laughs> Right. Well, it's basic. It's, it's it's information again, and it's what I what we started out talking about. It's communications. If you haven't got your communications right, you've got a problem to start off with. Um, and what I would suggest is, if in Western, you consider, um, you consider holding some, for instance, workshops, whereby you invite the local community in, and explain to them exactly what it is you're doing, and. It, it's very difficult to get to people at the moment in any case because of the pandemic so you're really talking about a better communication a line of communications once the pandemic's over so that you can invite people in and things like that these are things i can help you with as well so these are things that we talked about at, at, for example big world uh how would we convince the people well we what you do is you set people to talk to people yeah, and, and this is where the top down doesn't work. It's got to be ground up, then it works. Um, and, and, and in that way, you've got people being informed on the ground. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, you can have your own version of rewilding. That's absolutely fine. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, there are certain things that will need to be maintained. Um, and as long as you're straight with people, if you're not straight with people, they'll just say, hang on a minute, I thought you were doing rewilding. Why are you cutting that down? You'll have problems. So you need to get your communications right from the very start and, and deliver that into a workshop situation. You've then got the spider effect of communication. You've got that one person goes off, talks to half a dozen more and says, actually, this is what we're doing. And those half a dozen people then go off and they talk to even more people. and on it goes that's the way to do it Perfect. ground up ground up yep ground up totally agree um chris it's been an absolute pleasure uh, thank you so much for talking to us and i did hear and i will cut that edit out that you volunteered to come and help us so so it's like it's you know you might as well have written that with blood now i've got it recorded oh. there's, there's no way out <laughs> becky can i just say something and this is for the audience as well out there can I just tell everybody out there a little secret? Okay, go. Becky didn't think we'd make it to an hour. <laughs> it's now one hour 
11 minutes and 14 seconds. Who's going to dry up? Yeah, I know. I didn't think that you would dry up. It's just I thought if we run out of questions, because I, I, because I can sit and talk to you all, all, all you know, all night, obviously, because I'm a chatty, a chatty person. Anyway. But like you said, ground up, it's got to be coming in through questions. We've got to have the engagement from people. But I can't. I, we have had 64 comments. I've hardly been able to keep up. So thank you, everybody who participated. And I just do a couple of really plugs. That. Yes, of course. Of Plug away. Say hello to uh, Jonathan and Laura at Wild Portishead. Keep going, folks. Um, don't forget, Wild Portishead is on uh, Facebook. So go to our Facebook page if you want any inspirations for what you're doing wherever you are. Um, and um, I really do believe, uh, most sincerely, folks, I really do believe that, you know, the, the next phase of nature recovery and nature conservation in this country is community-led and community-based for the benefit of wildlife and people. Chris Faring, thank you ever so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, everyone go and have a wonderful evening. Uh, do uh, go and visit our website and um, sign up if you would like to become part of our volunteer programme. This whole thing wasn't a big, massive plug for that, um, but it's just to, um, give everybody tips and hints over things that they can do. We will be doing this monthly. I'll have another expert for you next month. And so do uh, keep checking back on the uh, Town Council website and also on our Facebook. Hey, 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 hey. I, I'm not an expert. You know, what an ex you know what an expert is, don't you? X is something that has been, and no. spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> Yeah, you break it down into two. X means past it and spurt is like a drip under pressure. Ah, that was the way. <laughs> Chris has been brilliant. Thank you ever so much. I shall end our Facebook uh, live now and uh, and thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you.